think uh, we can be ready to go if you'd like to. We are uh, going. Take it away, Angie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March 31st research series. Uh, I wanted to do just a couple quick housekeeping notes before we get going and remind you that on April Monday, April 5th, we will have Seth Fry talking to our colloquium series. And then, of course, next week, uh, we will have, are we yet Dr. Yusun? Uh, but we will have on April 7th, uh, the bureaucratic local politician uh, relations conversation as part of our research series. Which brings me to today. Today, we're gonna to talk about the use of institutional analysis for defining focal action situations in Mexican cultural heritage. With us today is Jorge, who is a very active member with the Ostrom Workshop, and is always a wonderful pleasure to have you speak. Um, you can feel free to share slides, and as is usual the case in all of our virtual meetings, I will help keep the queue as best I can. And in the chat box, we'll sort of remind you what order you're in so you can be ready to unmute uh, when it's time for you to ask a question. And of course, you're always welcome to type a question in the chat, and I'm happy to read it um, uh, to our speaker today as well. So Jorge, if you'd like to take it away. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to see you all. Uh, nice to see you again. I mean, virtually, but an amazing exercise this to speak out about our work. So today I will share my screen. Let me do it a little bit. Okay, so take a minute. I hope that everyone can see this. So this is a long name, but also it is not a better way to name it this. It's a, nice, it's a nice exercise how to use the institutional analysis applied and what is my expertise area that is uh, cultural heritage management, this case in Mexico, but also this project is, is going uh, through some changes. I mean, difficult this name it, uh, global changes somehow. So obviously the first I'll say is like, some acknowledgement. So obviously the Vincent in our strong workshop provides me obviously all the uh, tools necessary to do this exercise. And also the Randall Deborah Toya Center supports and the last uh, the past summer some of my field work. And now that I am working with Indiana University of Museum of Archaeology Anthropology former Len Black Laboratory. So it's, it's, uh, is uh, something I have to say at this point. So this is kind of sort of the abstract of the paper that you only have the opportunity to read. Uh, and this is like uh, just an, um, as I said, it's just an exercise how can we apply, uh, and how can we analyze the polycentricity governance? Uh, it's a just an overview uh, how it's happening in the Mexican cultural system that I name it in that way because uh, as you might notice uh, or you might uh, watch on the on my on my graphs can be joined in a very very milestone of action situations that happen through time so i mean it just said it, it's for saying that i am using uh, that is calling a uh, network of adjacent action, action situation analysis and the combined ead is s is s uh Framework that is something that is recently published and is very practical in my uh, in my research. So, I have three just very brief uh, sentences that describe this paper. One of them is like a, our focus in, in local community that is challenged uh, in the way that they don't that they wanted to manage their own cultural heritage and they have some actual situations with government controls and other actors. Uh, made a, a situation that implies uh, some cases conflict, some cases other outcomes. So what I want to show is how the application of EAD framework can show this contrast uh, of management between the, in the, I mean, through the time and also in this moment in Mexican cultural heritage or archaeological arena. And this, uh, I will show you two examples. That is the these two uh, collective choice uh, programs uh, that is the names are uh, Procede Ina and Conaculta. Procede Ina is focused on archaeology versus land, and the Conaculta is, uh, I could say, archaeology versus financial mechanisms. So, just for uh, name of the, uh, the theory behind this or so the papers that I use, uh, 
and probably you know because uh, I had the opportunity to see this. This is just uh, six papers. But, uh, one of I, I want to highlight is the uh, common source and bundle of rights that was part of the proposal for the Ostrom research uh, proposal. So I am uh, trying to get into this concept of resources and bundle of rights in my examples and trying to show how this uh, plays uh, on field. Just very brief. This is this is where the concepts are come from. Um, obviously, uh, this is uh, the basic uh, uh, framework of the EAD, but also this uh, 2019. Uh, I want to say actualization, but it's update or, or something that is proposed by Professor Paul, Professor McGinnis, and another scholar. So how can we uh, look better uh, what is happening in the in the focal action situations? And also there is another paper from Professor McGinnis from 2011 that is showing us how the actors uh, plays and roles inside all the network of uh, action situations. So that for me is very foundational for taking a, a, a position about. So just to name it, we are gonna look is like, uh, so there is a, there is enough data to say that after the implementation of the reforms, uh, in the case of archaeological record, it is, it is an undeniable growth of number of records. So the second one is also the this exists after uh, the changes or reforms of 1988 or 1992 that there's a conflict between communities and, and, and government agencies and government itself about the management of the archaeological resources. And, and the third, that is the outcome that I am uh, looking after this exercise is like the creation of the patronage of the government itself uh, to keep to in on control the financial mechanism. So that is uh, something, in my opinion, opened the cultural sector to private initiative. Um, just very quick, this is how it looks, the distribution in archaeological sites in Mexico at the moment. This is from 2018. So uh, if you look, then I want to show you this image is just to visualize uh, the distribution because it's very important. So this one is archaeological sites. And that is partially uh, the, the, the information that we got from this source. So that, it, that is important to say that if you if you uh, see the records, it is 48,000 officially recorded, but it's estimated more than 200,000 sites. So that means that we have uh, um, performance challenge uh, for this INC that is the, the INA in this case. Uh, that is the main important point of this. Uh, also only 193 are open to public, which were services by state. But what I want to show you is like that there is a very correlation between indigenous population and distribution in Mexico and archaeological sites. And also it's related to our case because if we remember we are looking for land and archaeology issues. And you see the social property distribution in Mexico. This is so, is so linked in the way that the distribution also um, is, similar, is similar to the archaeological distribution and also for the indigenous distribution. So we have um, something interesting to show on, on under this perspective. Can be, that can be important in our case to develop the Questions uh, about uh, these uh, these issues. So last time we I spoke here, I show you this. That was the for, the former version of the district of the we can say the the, the levels of of show, the levels of I mean in this case uh, meta constitutional constitutional and collective and operative uh, laws and uh, also policies that had in place. In Mexico, but we have an evolution. I mean, based on the new study on, this, on the new researches that I that I had done and practice, and also these blue areas are the areas that I am I'm, I'm very interested to study forward. So we are looking for the first one in this paper, but we will look for the next one in the next paper. I hope on the next uh, research to look at the second one. So just a very brief and some information that you already have on, on this paper is what happened in, in this uh, Procedina issue, uh, a Procedina program. The program was funded for the regularization of the land tenure. So that implies that the state uh, will close the process of land reform that started in the Mexican revolution at the beginnings of the 20th century. That was the problem. 
So about archaeology, we had a problem. So we had a problem because approximately half of all the national resources uh, being or have been or stays in social property, according to the data of 1992. So obviously, if you are presenting an um, infra infrastructure program for this uh, period of time, you will uh, cross uh, or come across with some archaeological resources. So one of the, probably the outcomes that we see and where I show you in the in the network, uh, so that the, the main outcomes is like the number of archaeological sites certified by this program. Uh, they recognize, officially recognize the cognition of comuneros and ejidatarios that are the main actors in this, in the land, uh, the social property land. And also, obviously, the archaeological resource has a, at this time an official recognition. So how it looks when we apply this some sort of interaction on or trying to apply the network and the interactions. Uh, what are the what are the situations? What are the before and after apply when the, this program was applied? So this is very clear. So we have certainly so we have we have certain data about the theoretical size, not all of them, obviously, because the list is increasing by year by year. But at that time it was very nice to or very, very nice for the government to know. They have now in a record of more than 20,000 20, sites uh, in this period. Uh, and also, it's a recon, important recognition for self government assemblies from of comuneros and ejidatarios as a landowners. And also, this uh, well, probably is an indirect impact of this program is like uh, most of the sites that were recognized as big sites at the time uh, has uh, had an uh, um, influence the tourist industry in Mexico. So, but at this moment, uh, the important thing is like, uh, they recognize the, by certification as a formal territory system, they recognize the land, recognize the archeological uh, resources that were inside or are inside of this land. And the other case is like this, uh, that is named Colect Conacultaina. Uh, so this happened at the same time. So that's important to know that not just something that happened separately. So this is something that happened uh, at the same time. So at this, in this moment, so at this case is about financial mechanisms applied to cultural resources. And it's something important to know because probably for us it's common to say that we have philanthropy in the United States, for example, but that, that didn't happen in Mexico before. So that is another set of policies that have been um, applied in Mexico since 1992. And for example, this institute that is the Conaculta was created for coordinate over the existent uh, I mean, institutes. Uh, so they look for an integration of the national system of institutions over all the institutions and entities, no matter if they're also nationals or not. So they wanted to keep the control, keep the control to all the, this case, including archaeology. So the main outcomes are they show how this applies like 14 mega projects, archaeological projects in Mexico in 1992 and 1994. Uh, and, that, uh, that, and these 14 projects influence uh, that or to what 252 theoretical projects had some uh, opportunity to be to were in this program uh, at 1998. So that means that it is a big uh, umbrella of this program that touch at least uh, one side in one state in Mexico. So we have 31. So, so the main the, one of the main outcomes is the creation of subnational mechanisms, but not in the proper way because they didn't change a lot. They apply it and, and ask for the subnational levels to create financial mechanisms that applies for specific programs. Uh, but that was a, what does the starting point or a third case that is the in a patronage. But at this moment, it looks like this. So in, 19, in between 1988 and 1992, and then to outcomes uh, till 2016. So we have several uh, and, and very uh, important outcomes. This that we can call it Mexican cultural system and apply it to archaeology versus financial mechanism. And this is the case that is the state trust. It's the first time that a state can do uh, or can invest and can accept private uh, investments in the case of archaeology. But also there is a, a very, uh, in the story that I show you in the milestone that I show you before, in the specific back arrows are 
specific co-funded mechanism for archaeological investment. So that's something new, that's something that happened in that time. And that opened the door to new mechanisms that, that uh, existed through the time uh, after 1980. Uh, so just for mentioning this, this is obviously not, not part of the of this paper, but it's the third moment that I am interested to uh, that's the one of, oh, sorry. So that's the one that is happening in 2019 because it's a series of evolution of politics. Now in Mexico, we have an, a ministry of culture that never happened before for the time they will be education sector and uh, historical sector. They were together till, night, till 2015. That division is a decentralization policy that also uh, provokes that we have a national uh, mechanism for financing. We call it patronage, but there are several types. In this case is named patronage. At this, as I told, as I just appointed, it's like the way that the government is up and the private investment. So just uh, referring to the, to the, in this case, uh, applying uh, the EAD framework to, for example, this case, that was the case of Austin research uh, proposal. So uh, you may notice that this that this uh, uh, set of tools that we can have now, uh, we can apply it at this case in the Oaxaca, in Oaxaca study case. Uh, the criteria for choosing a site, for example, is like uh, you, in this case, it's a second race archaeological site. Uh, it's a communal or ethical land ownership that is important because that includes a self government action situations that in this case, communal and ethical assembly is the the body or the, the that took that takes decisions about the land, and this is a four and uh, criteria that is a low influence by government NGO agency at the moment opening as the communal rule site. This case applies uh, for this case in a specific, and I will show you how. So you remember in my last presentation, I just show you this very quick. That is a network of how this what is the if we can just visualize the cultural heritage management in Oaxaca. It will looks like this is referring to how uh, the decisions are taking place and the importance of the sites. But also we are looking at, or we are focused on this zone that is or this, that you look at the at the star. The star means that it's a World Heritage site. In this case is the Cuevas uh, Historicas de Yagula and Midland. How is the system or the OSIP system, if we can say it, this at this part of, of the state? So or for example, it's like very uh, interesting example because uh, it, it joins a lot of uh, criteria, but also adds more points to the conversation. So, in a brief story about this, located in, in Zapalo Villa de Mitla, Oaxaca, that is a, is a 45 kilometers uh, town uh, outside of Oaxaca City, that is the capital. It's considered part based on the archaeological resources of the World Heritage Site, that is, was named in 2010. So the important situation here is like in 2018, the communeros or peasant landlords, we can name it like that, uh, inaugurate a communal project that is the historic cave of Midland. So this open to public. So for do that, they receive a certification of 4,200 4, square kilometers as a voluntary natural area. So that's this important because it's like, a, I mean, at least as, as we know, and as probably, uh, and, there, and it would be important to do a further research about this, but it's the first, first common uh, rule plan about low impact visiting in dry caves. And then obviously, uh, as we uh, name it in the criteria that, that make a conflict with the state. I mean, since 2018, also they have a uh, visitation of around 300, including international audience. So uh, I'm following the, the Ostrom proposal, I will say that they were my questions about it. So if we can say that this communal heritage management is, uh, is something for saying just briefly, and we can, it, it, and, the, and how they impact the bundle of right of use and owners and now this project with the historical caves. The second one is how they organize the property rights, because it's important to, to have the big picture about the property ownership so, and the third is less, uh, how the, the inequalities of benefits of the members of that uh, body uh, that generates obviously the property right, but also the implementation of this, of this program. For, uh, for 
uh, just try to in order the ideas, actors, and situations, and, re and resources, and obviously all the the, po the possible uh, um, possible uh, focal action situations, worth name it. I took this example from Professor Maginis uh, from 2011, explaining how can we do an historical uh, uh, overview about the about the different action situations that we have. So I just obviously adapted to, to this. Uh, it looks like obviously like something that uh, there are very highlighted things there because it's important to, to know some about the story of the place, but also it's very interesting how to, to, to look around this chart, uh, how the regulations changes to the time. Uh, there is a very highlighted important thing about the economic value because it changed about according to the, pol the policies of the government at the beginnings of the 20th century. Uh, and then uh, this another interest that is the natural sector natural sector interest that came change the rules of the of the of the I mean the, not just the land it's changed the rules about all the organizations along the land. So for me. At this moment, uh, that is the last uh, the last uh, analysis that is very important to me to show you other new resources like this uh, communal status that are self regulations uh, rule of set of set of rules uh, that is under uh, I mean they are ongoing and we, it will be interesting to measure the, the outcomes that these self regulations uh, will will have um, I mean in the short term as in the long term, because this is something that is happening mostly more to the natural sector guidelines, but this just affects, the, as we will show you in the next slide, that will affect the, the outcomes in the archaeological uh, resources. So just briefly, this is what I show you uh, in, the, in the last uh, presentation about how this is a process, the process of, a, of an opening a site, archaeological site in Mexico. But I also referring to the new perspective of this. So that information that I show you can be fit in this interesting exercise for Professor McGuinness in 2011. So it, it can imply the, the role of each actor and how uh, how will be the outcomes from each actor and the situations, action situations that imply uh, specific situations through the time. So I, I try based on this uh, to reproduce uh, what is uh, what could be the outcomes or what could be the probably the probable situation that uh, can uh, show you the these uh, roles and actors and what is the obviously the motivations that is very important but also what happened in some situations in a specific so I mean I will say like uh, this is kind of the most important because it, well, it, it can be developable, but I constitute a communal assembly as an actor because this is not, it's a set of it's a people joining in a, a legal actor based on law that make decisions from itself and define uh, priorities and activities and also the one that's a body to receive grants and receive uh, donations. But for me, I mean, a set of rules that is the communal status is very important to have uh, recognize it as, a, as, a, as an actor. Um, and also there's, it happened something very, very sad for the towns, as you can see this, but also this, uh, also test what, what, I, what this exercise is going to a point. It's like uh, what happened is a bad situation or a very grateful situation that this happened. So it wasn't like normally the state, uh, uh, place and, this, and, this, and the and the locality uh, or the or the location and having this performance or enforcement of law. So now the, the, the local agrarian authorities as the communal assembly uh, had a main participation on this solving of the problem. So so you can see in this situation uh, the communal management and regime for the fine salt in action. And also you can see the formal regulations and the other informal regulations because they, they took some agreements in order to solve the situation at the time. So that's obviously it's a bad new for the painis because obviously it's a disgrace. But for the purpose of this, um, show how the change of different sets of institutions is happening. And this is good. 
least for this project so bad for the penis. Um, so yeah, so going further, I mean, just wanna show you what is uh, my second site based on what happened on the pandemic that we weren't able to go to my other site that I proposed that was in uh, South Chiapas in the South part of Mexico. So I decided to, uh, to went further to my third option that is in United States, that is in the state of Indiana, that is the engine mouse site, that is the main archaeological site in Indiana. So as you can see some of the characteristics of this site, I just fit the criteria it does fit the criteria for this uh, uh, for the purpose of this research. So the most important is the multi-level agree management agreement between all the institutions. IU is the academical part of this. There are some state, uh, some state, the important DNR, but also the Indiana State Museum that is has an entire network in Indiana. Uh, some federal agencies that uh, obviously the content and the Shawnee, the Miami and other historical tribes under the NACPA program, that is the one that I want to study from here, and most of them focus on, this have some pieces in the management of the sites and some decisions that is taking place. So just a brief how it looks. Uh, this, uh, and, and this is a reconstruction, and based on this uh, article of Buchanan, and Thomas, Crane, and Sieber, we have a map that we can just visualize how the distribution of the site. Uh, it, it's fair to say that it's, it's a, a critical speaking, it's a very important site. Is that all the Mississippi and Ohio River system? Uh, jo, in Cahokia and Iqua uh, in Georgia, that is a very, I'm not sure about the name, it's, but it's another important site. Or two. That is uh, in, an important system and then world site. But what I want about this, if we apply, uh, if we apply the same uh, type of resourcing, uh, or, the type, or the milestone exercise on the US. So it could, it could look like this. So obviously there is a lot of, of, of decisions taken here. The main, for the main purpose of, the, of this exercise, uh, the blue areas highlighted are the, the one that I am interested in. The first, I just will describe the first one. Uh, that is the WA, FERA, FRA. So uh, what is happening after 1928, which is the, the crisis, uh, and also this program was part of the something named the World Relief Archaeology, and that happened under 1935 and 1932, but also the most important collection from this side came from this time. Uh, and it's, all, it's an ongoing project that is uh, happening now in the IUMA, a former uh, Glenn Black Laboratory in Indiana, it's happening in Bloomington, and it's just the the uh, the manage of the collection for, uh, I mean, like a renewing materials. Um, I mean, what has happened? What is important here, uh, besides the the creation of millions of uh, works and and that there is like a, this a collective choice decision making level affects archaeology because it's is the foundational action for the site. Also. Uh, it's a, it's a trilateral agreement at this time. So it's the Indiana University, the Indiana Historical Society, who acted as a, as a sponsor, and also the Indiana Historical Bureau. That is something that inspires somehow, based on what I am thinking, inspires the mega projects in Mexico because it's based on the same structure. And I am sure that it was something there that I can rely. So as I say, as I say it, and I, I just wanted just to finish this, I just have a few slides uh, ahead. So we know this. So what I wanted just to show you today, like uh, there is a very correlation between this, the, the 1990, 1988 and 1992 reforms and programs that were, that were established by the government of Mexico related to land, related to financial mechanisms applied to anthropology. I wanted to show you is like uh, the actual uh, National Anthropology History Institute patronage that was created in, in 2019. Uh, in my opinion, is the way that the states open to private investment uh, the archaeological system in Mexico. Uh, and what I wanted to show you there is like uh, all the dynamics of conflicts that can be seen in on this. Uh, I don't mean in, the, in between these resources. Can be explained, uh, but some other decisions that were taking place before need constitute a system of networks of adjacent and focal actions. 
um, what is what is coming, huh, hopefully, a few words in summer 2000, 2021, will be part of the former Oaxaca 2020 uh, summer agenda. So what is, what is coming, usually to work more about, to have enough, enough information about the actor and case action situations in Angel Mounds. So we're using the, the, uh, the IW library, the IUMA library, the Indian Historical Society library, all the, all the information that I can get. I'm still in working in, a, in, a, in an article that points uh, so most of the economical anthropology situations that happens uh, in, in a very, a grassroots line to explain some situations that I wanted to explain later. So it's, I am working with Dr. Melo from IU Economics and obviously the situation about funding and research proposal that is coming this, this year. And there is another uh, was part of the Tobias proposal. So joins a program or do a program probably including uh, the Austrian workshop if they, <laughs> they are able to about the common heritage working agenda. I just, as last I wanted to show you this is how it looks uh, the concepts that is related to Austrian theory, but it's not based on Austrian theory in Zapotec, the Zapotec of the Valley of Oaxaca. This is happening not, uh, I mean, not ask uh, a scholar is happening because they wanted to show in a new communal, communal center in the Teotitan del Valle town. How they explain what is the concepts that they have and they is close to the meaning, in this case of reciprocity. So this is the, the Zapotec writing and there is the, the, the English translation. In this case is reciprocity. And this, the second case is uses and customs. That is a system that is a, something that is called a constitutional law that is not uh, very common use in, in, uh, in the literature. Um, and, the, and yeah, and this is uh, something that is uh, and the third one that is very important to me that is how to explain communal property, their own uh, mindset. That is obviously uh, pretty different about their property or about uh, other kinds of property that is more close to the idea of social property. And then, so we are complete, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we are back. Hello everyone again. So the queue, the queue has started and of course, um, we'll get it started really quickly here. Isan, you wanna go first? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So thank you very much, Jorge. It was a pleasure to read your paper and listen to your presentation. My comments are directed towards making your paper more accessible for non-archaeologists, non-anthropologists non like myself. So um, one comment that I have is that if you could put your research questions first in your presentation, like they come a lot after, if you can put them first, it could help us keep track of, you know, how IAD or SIS framework help answer your question. So, and I think in your presentation, you have IAD, you have SIS, you have focal action situations. There's a lot going on in macro dynamics. So you, you, I think we, you provide a lot of valuable information about macro dynamics, but due to the time constraints, you know, it, it limits your ability to go down to, to, to micro dynamics that really inform us about what's going on. So I think it would be a good idea to uh, manage this dynamic. Also, um, in your paper, you use some terms such as a yiddel land, a, a yiddel land. So some terms are unclear, was un were unclear to me. It would, it would help to you know disclose what they mean. And my question is: so you had this opening from the state, you know, you had greater self-governance engagement. But you had some unexpected outcomes, such as the uh, vandal case of vandalization. So, do you consider this as a negative externality of this, you know, self-initiatives, or you know, how would you consider this outcome? Thank you. 
Uh, um, and I appreciate, I appreciate it very well, very well. I mean, so good your comments. So yeah, for saying the first one, yeah, it will be so helpful to have the, <laughs> the beginning, the questions for sure. Of course, uh, I appreciate that comment. Uh, and the second one, I wanna, I wanna, yeah, some of the concepts about land is based on the, I mean, the current uh, law in Mexico, how they consider the land. For example, a concept like social property uh, is something that opens the, the table to a lot of explanations and a lot of other names that people gave to, to this concept. So it is not common in the, uh, for example, in, in the English literature because there is so much other types of uh, or land tenure that uh, it explains how what is happening in Mexico. Uh, another, and the third one, obviously, there, yeah, so obviously it will be an externality. We can consider that the, the, the vandalicide episode that happened to this. So it, it, um, if you wanted like a, an ex, a, a, like a, something, I was reading Harding at the time that this happened. So that explains so that when something is damaged because it's open and there is no rules and there is no barriers and that's in my mind that something uh, well, at least if we have an explanation, so to be sure this is the resource and, and we can just explain this, but also as you might not, as you notice, it's very important to to give the name to the things and obviously an externality will be a, a good one for, a bad externality will be a good thing for this. So thank you, I appreciate you. you. Jamie? Yeah, Jamie, you want to yeah, hello. Thank you so much, Jorge, for such an interesting talk. And you've done some really, really, really cool things. Um, you have so much to talk about. I suspect you'll get several articles out of your work or book chapters and, and things. Um, I was wondering, I'm, I'm kind of looking through your paper. I haven't finished yet. But this concept of culture that you keep coming back to, cultural heritage, like that idea um, seems to permeate your paper. Have maybe i just missed it or not run across it yet but did you def did you grapple with like what culture is and means in your context in other words like is there a definition of culture that you need to present in your work or is that something that you can assume that everybody in your field understands you know what you mean by that term yeah thank you and also this is a very reliable question i mean probably i assume that uh, that the concepts are like a just widespread yeah, so well, for, for, for giving a, a context about this, this is related about what is the guidance of cultural heritage based on the, obviously, main convention of world heritage and all these uh, concepts that were implied on the guidelines that are, that are rules. Uh, obviously, in the, case, in the case of Mexico, there are another set of rules that, that you know, more concepts about what a cultural heritage means and now that is intangible land tangible heritage, I mean, heritage that, that makes something complex. And yeah, so, so going to that question, I mean, giving that in context about the, the um, I mean, the, the, the vast concept of cultural heritage, I say like, a, uh, yeah, so I am I, in I, I, that this is clear, but obviously I, I, I wanted to say that it's good to me to know that I have to go further and explain better the, this concept. So I appreciated you. Comment. Well, and of course the idea, sorry, I'm going to jump in one real quick just to, um, but yeah, and even the idea of culture, I remember I was in a group with other students from all different disciplines, and we were trying to come up with a common definition of culture. It's really hard. And so even like cultural heritage is one thing and culture is another part and the cultural part of the cultural heritage to me would, would be different whether you're talking about Indiana or Mexico. Just some things to think about. It's but it's really rich, and that's what makes this work so much fun. And that's why I, I this is a, that is an amazing thing because this is this is the one I wanted to to challenge my myself to research about the set of rules and applying to the many contexts as I most can do in my, for my dissertation. So in this case, comparing uh, the the state the United States with Mexico giving me a, like a just more information about the differences for sure and also that is important to say that for example an APRA project in Mexico at this moment wouldn't be possible but that also means that giving back the the human remains to uh, to the tribes in this case the states so there Mexico there is another another name for people that belongs to an indigenous community 
And yeah, yeah that's something that I appreciate your comment. And I, I am glad that you got that from that from my paper. Thank you so much. I think we lost Angie. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, puppy has decided right now is when he should be here. Uh, but I have the queue open. Is there any other questions that we have? Because I can always tee up a few. So can you put up your act? Oh, wait, I see someone's unmuted. Would you like to go? Sorry, I can't see your name. Apologies. I was going to um, ask a question. My internet connection is very bad. So I don't know if this will work. And my camera is also down on the lower part of my laptop. So sorry about my ear. Um, the comment question I wanted to make is that I think the point here is that the, the, the definition of culture that's relevant is the definition that the Mexican government uses. And that is um, um, probably a more, a relatively cut and dried um, practical definition. And I think part of the difficulty that Jorge is describing is um, captured by the fact that the government definition of culture and cultural heritage probably isn't flexible enough to suit the many communities that are being affected in this, um, on this issue. Is that Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I guess just kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so that's in the very interesting point. And, and thank you, Professor Kramer, to address that. So, this, yes, so Mexico is a very, very nationalistic frame country. So, that obviously defines a lot of situations that happen around not just archaeology, but we call it as the materiality of cultural heritage. But it happens around a lot of situations that define what is. Uh, a validation of the cultural heritage for saying something. So it's just a very square frame uh, situations that happen in a nationalistic country that also that, that is why uh, it's important to me to show another set of institutions around land that happens because this is something about just happening in one sense. It's happening like a system, like a frame. Uh, so this is why I imply the idea that land a financial mechanism, but could will be another one for sure, uh, and show you what is the framework of the heritage in Mexico. The queue is open still. So I, I had a question that follows up on that. If no one else wants to jump in, we try to give preference to students and I see students here, so. Okay, can you, so I gave him a chance. Can you pop, can you show your slides again? I wanted to see you had done, or you have done sort of all the stuff that impacts, I can't remember what slide it is, apologies. And it, it talks about the different laws and stuff that can overcome, that can impact this. Yeah, let me, I should have paid attention to which slide it, number it was, sorry. No, no, you're with, just let me go. <laughs> Sorry, I should have given. I could have given you a heads up in the tech in the text to. Okay, so my window is doing something right. Oh, okay, we go back. So yeah, so you say. Um, yeah, one right. of those will work. I think that's. I think it's number seventeen. I think will work. I know you were you were when you were talking. You were using it for something else. But I guess here's, this is my, I think it follows up on what has just been asked, but I could be very wrong. When you, when you broke this out, and I don't know the answer to this, by the way, I mean this as a genuine question. This isn't like a, you know, an oral defense of your, <laughs> your entire position. When you broke this out, it, it looks to me like there's some missing, or I would assume there are some missing regulations from this, when I think about cultural heritage, is that intentional? Are, are you trying to, 
I think it probably follows up on what Jamie's asking. So, so maybe I'm also, you know, to me, there would be many more possible laws that would impact what I think of as cultural heritage, and I could be wrong. But, but you have focused on some very specific ones. Are you intending to do that? Or is the framework um, and the definition that's being used forcing you into that, that particular choice, that narrowing of a very broad category? Does that make sense? No, it totally makes sense. And, and I say like, uh, it will be that second one that in to the time that I've been researching of the, how is the body of the legislation of cultural heritage, I mean, in this case in Mexico, I've been attracted to the idea of these two areas that is highlighted in blue. And uh, obviously the selection about some of the laws that I show in this milestone reflects the complex body of these laws and the results to the time affected the, the time this the, the periods that I wanted to show at this at this moment but also uh, it's important to say that it, it, it into time is joined in a system uh, of what I call you the Mexican cultural system that is and the institutions of legislations on that system it's kind not not uh, it kind of reflects this uh, milestone. Uh, for the purpose of this paper, the purpose of this research, that is the loss that affects uh, really the outcome, in really way the outcomes of these uh, focal situations, actual situations. But obviously, uh, as you said, there is probably uh, provoked or probably pushed by some specific areas of research that I wanted to address. <laughs> Can I can I ask a follow up? And and I I am keeping track. I'm not trying to monopolize. So I'm trying to think how to ask this oddly because I have no or directly because I have no real knowledge of how the laws in Mexico would overlap the way that we we behave. But why not have other rights, property driven rights that are probably or could be impacting these conversations as well. And I don't know there are any, but I assume there are. Oh, you are, you are right, there are. So there are another kind of regulations, I mean, in the collective uh, choice uh, and also in the operational level. Right. That, are, that are really, uh, they are not affecting directly archeology, span they okay. exist. So that's important to say, and I appreciate that you, you uh, add this to the conversation there are. They are not reflecting an outcome in archaeology. I mean, it, it helps. so this is part of the set of rules. But when you are referring to an archaeology and outcomes, referring to, to the time in archaeology in issues, there is there are not a very uh, affecting somehow. Okay, so I guess following up on a couple of other, just almost um, for the sake of presentation. My guess is that if someone isn't is like me and is quasi familiar with you know property rights and certainly understands um, you know the polycentric argument about uh, with rules and institutions and all those overlap, I almost think there needs to be a slide where you say why well, you haven't done things that I would think would be part of this, but you have either excluded or you have um, or actually are truly not impactful. Right. And I think you get as a researcher, you get to do both. You can say, hey, look, I actually looked at these and determined they they were not impacting this particular uh, area, this action area. But there are other ones that you could just say, hey, look, that I'm I think maybe we're going to have to classify this all on its own. And therefore, I've excluded them. So I haven't even thought about it. And because when I think of cultural heritage, I think of other property rights that would be impacting this. And my guess is, I mean, you've done so much work. You have excluded some. You've decided, or you've excluded some, but more importantly, you've decided some are not impactful. And that is so important to me it, for a couple of reasons. One, and the biggest one, and, and I mean, this is something um, just from a faculty point of view. If you've looked at something and determined that it's not impactful, you should get credit for doing that work. <laughs> you did the work and decided not to include it because of the work you had done. And so I, I think maybe you need a slide in here that gives you credit for that. You know, when you can answer me that, hey, yeah, clearly there are other things that you would assume were in here, but I determined they were not impactful in this particular environment, get credit for that. <laughs> I mean, really get yourself credit for that. 
you don't have to spend a whole lot of time on it in all fairness i get why it probably would have interrupted you know your your stream of thought because you've done tons of work um but have it somewhere so that you know you're you're showing that hey look i i literally i i took these out of the conversation because they just sort of get in the way by the time i explain to you how it is that i determined they weren't impactful I run the risk of you being more interested in that than you are in my main thesis, you know, so it's sort of one of those recommendations of, hey, a long footnote, you know, um, but so that, and this was precisely where I started thinking about it. I was like, wow, that's a lot of institutions that are overlapping. There are clearly some that, some laws, especially that I would expect to be there that aren't, but I can see, as I look at this much more closely, I can see how they, they wouldn't neatly fit in here. And I, I would give myself credit. The other reason, and I'd like to echo the put your research questions right up front. So when I heard you get to those, that really helped me uh, frame the conversation that you were having. And maybe don't put the research questions exactly as the research questions, if that interrupts the way that you conceptually think about how you wanted to do this presentation, but at least start with um, you know some type of, I, you sort of started with an orientation of how you got there as opposed to sort of what's the question. And I think that's just a, I mean, I'm not, not truly a social scientist, but I think what that does is makes everyone, all the social scientist, scientist types in the room, take a deep breath and go, okay, at least I've oriented myself to where I'm going. Um, you know, here's the question that sort of oriented myself. Um, we've, you've gotten several comments about great presentation. We are running a little bit short on time, we've got probably five or six more minutes so we can do questions if anyone um has more questions i want to be sure we're being uh respectful of everyone's time as well i will give everyone a heads up i've gotten at least three emails of various people that have come in and left and come in and left and we are having some connectivity problems not just um not just for the people who have survived on the call but also from we lost um i've gotten at least three emails so apologies for that. Such is a Wednesday, I suppose. Can, yeah, of course. Can I go on? So, um, well, very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I, I was thinking uh, probably in a kind of a, with a very different perspective. At the beginning, you, you listed um, potentially five, uh, 500,000 sites or with a potential value. And then there are only, I know, around 200 or 150 that are open to the public. So and I'm, then I was thinking more about what, what kind of the um, kind of the optimal number that you that you make um, available to the public, uh, or you declare as a site with interest. So you cannot go for everything because then there are economic costs of declaring. Uh, you know, I will not allow you to do farming here because uh, you need to wait that, I know, I be 20 years figuring out if this has archaeological value or not. But at the same time, well, I know just having, you know, two sites open, maybe that's suboptimal. So maybe there was kind of room to think more about, well, what would be the optimal rule, then have that as a benchmark, and then compare the actual policies, institutionals, with that benchmark, no? Yeah, and also I appreciate the comment because that is that gave me the opportunity to say that what I am looking is like the uh, community is doing that job, open sites. Uh, if that solves the problem of having all the agreements, I mean, bottom to top, uh, uh, the implementation of the set of rules that is explained in this example of NICLA that is happening uh, there is another 16 that it is happening in Mexico. But they, of course, having this issue uh, and challenge the, in somehow challenge the state to think different about the, what it happened when a community decides open a, to visit, to public visit uh, an archaeological site, not taking in account so much the other levels of uh, institutions that already uh, exist since a long time ago. So uh, that is that is uh, that is important to say. That is why I'm looking the possibility to take this concept of of, of commons uh, apply it to this and uh, an archaeological join uh, situations. 
uh, in the case of Mexico and also in, in obviously in, in other in other contexts. Because uh, I think that it's important to think differently in, in that way because it's not something that just uh, is invented. So this happened. There are some very and several cases that it happened in Mexico, just a few at this moment. Also, it, it, uh, it shows that it's something happening about the way of the decisions around archaeology in the country. So, uh, so, so saying that, obviously, the optimal to me, of optimal to so into this, this and it, at the price of this project, that the communities will be in a, a, able to rule uh, by themselves their own sites, applying, obviously, most of the institution of care about the archaeology, of course, but ruled by themselves and having the opportunity to, to at least test themselves, have the opportunity to rule their own sites. Other questions? We've got time maybe for one more. Well, I can offer a follow-up question to all of this. So, and of course I'm going back to my question about culture just because that's what I think about a lot. But um, but I know, is it Professor Byrne? She was talking about how like the operating definition of culture, of course, be the Mexican government's operating definition. And that's true if you're looking for like a normative thing that's a uh, definition that's been codified. But we have to remember that also, also times in, oftentimes in cultural situations, we have like, we have norms that are operating, but they're not codified. They're, you know, informal norms. And so I just, I just want, and I think, it sounds like there's a recognition that that exists because of this desire to see the local communities manage their own resources and i think that's just really cool to be honest and um, because i know other like other states don't uh, don't honor that um, when i was in northeastern italy um a couple of years ago um it was in a small town called Estelia, and they have like a little museum and they had found like something from the roman i forget like a sword or something from the roman times and and like the 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 po river was like dry that day so they you know so it's something that they went would was able were able to find in the riverbank but they were but they were very careful to say we really don't want the people in um you know this in this bigger city to find out about it because they they might take it from us and put it in their own museum and so yeah i think it's really cool that that's not doesn't seem to be happening so far in the place in mexico where you're looking at this I appreciate your comment, and also that gives me the opportunity and a follow-up answer about the, the cultural issues. So it's why I try to show at the last slides the concepts about their, their, own, their own people concepts, or something that is related to Austrian literature, that is this concept of communal reciprocity, self-government. It's not in our words, it's in their words, and it's how they explain us, how they rule the, 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 the land, how they rule the situations that we can call it in, in that way, they are explaining us to us that it is happening, there are institutions happen, it's still happening, and, and there is the way that they rule their own decisions somehow. So, and it's important to say, and, and, I, and I say it very briefly, but I, I like it to that kind of situation that communality, prestige, reciprocity exists. I wanted just to add that to the attributes of the community in all the model that is the first strong model, it, it, it looks like a very important place for attributes of the community. So that's why I, I like the idea to frame uh, some actual situations and some situations that happen in, for saying something in actual, actual occasions and frame it in that way and try to show uh, a, a possible explanation for those situations. Seeing no more questions. Jamie, did you have a follow-up coming think of it? You're looking like maybe you did. <laughs> okay, seeing no more questions in the queue. I'd like to thank you, Jorge. It looks like I was going to mention or remind people about next Wednesday, but he's disappeared. He might've been one of the people that lost us. Uh, so uh, a reminder again, that of course, I'm sure Jorge would love to have comments if anyone has them. Um, he is... Uh, a frequent uh, participant at the Ostrom workshop. So we're very, very appreciative of that. Thank you very much. I always enjoy your presentations. Um, and uh, equally as important, then on Monday, we have the colloquium, of course, 
and I've closed my file, so I can't remember what who that's on, but as usual. And then of course, Wednesday, we have the research series for those of you who usually tune in there as well. Um, and uh, otherwise, I will uh, talk to everyone later. Thank you again, Jorge. Oh, thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see everyone.